today on Dr. Phil. She was a marathon runner. She was a teacher. And now. I don't have an eating disorder. I can't eat. And get this, Monica chains herself to the bed at night. In fear of food. Everything makes me sick. But is her cure? You brought your chains to LA. Why? The right cure. That is absolutely not true. Let's do it. Not a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready to take care of you. talking about a story that you may have experienced because it's a question for the ages. Is it physical health that drags down mental health or is it mental health that drags down physical health? And our guest today, Monica, has been suffering in both ways and it was quite an ordeal for her mother, Stephanie, to get her to Los Angeles just to see me. Now this was the state Monica was in before leaving for the airport. Take a look. I itch all over my body and I cry and my eyes itch and my tears burn and it itch my face. I shake and I get cold chills and sweats and cold chills and sweats and, and then I get massive headaches and it just goes on and on all day long. Well, Stephanie says her daughter Monica had a perfect life. She was a marathon runner, she was a teacher, and then all of a sudden she got sick and just lost 40 pounds. Now currently Monica is five foot six and she weighs 90 pounds. Now Stephanie claims Monica has triggers to binge eat during her sleep. Now she says it has gotten so bad that they have locks on the cabinets, the refrigerator, and get this, Monica chains herself to the bed at night. Take a look. Oh my God, they're going through this all day long. I'm just never eating again. <laughs> on a bad day, Monica's in the bed 22 of 24 hours. Not very functional at all. According to her, she has S-RED. Sleep-related eating disorder. It makes her get up at night and eat when she doesn't realize that she's doing it. We have a sign on our refrigerator that says no Xanax after a certain time at night because it causes night eating. Some of the things that we've done to stop her were to actually chain her to her bed. It gives her enough space to go to the restroom at night but not to get into anything else. We've also locked up all of the cabinets. Here's the lock on the fridge. I have the key, I sleep with the key. People look at my daughter and think that she has an eating disorder and it's not that. She eats because you have to eat to live and then she is in a great deal of pain. Paramedics have been to my house several times. In the last five or six years, Monica has gone to the hospital 10 times for a severe pain in her stomach. It hurts so bad, like stomach <laughs> Six years ago, she was pretty healthy looking, rosy complexion. Now she looks like a concentration camp victim. Her eyes are sunken in, her skin is sallow, her legs are bone and flesh. She's pretty scary looking. She looks like she's dying because she is dying. Monica's friend, Brianne, says Monica and her mother think they have a good relationship. She says it's not good at all. She says her relationship is toxic on so many levels. In the six years that I've been friends with Monica, I've never seen her eat a solid piece of food. She looks like a skeleton. She has no meat on her bones, and she looks very frail and pale. Monica and her mother believe they have a really good relationship. I believe that it's very toxic. My relationship with Monica is good, and we're very close. Monica relies on her mom for everything. I have to help her as much as I can, washing her hair, getting her a drink, 
bringing her her pills or any other kind of medication. Rub her tummy. I don't feel any bubbles though, do you? Anything that she wants, she can definitely get it from her mom. Monica's 100% dependent on me. Stephanie has given Monica her credit card information so Monica can order whatever she wants online and a lot of those things are the laxatives or things that are not good for her health. Monica is mostly financially dependent on me. She lives with me and I, you know, I pay the rent, the car insurance, whatever it is she needs. Because Stephanie can't say no to Monica, it's speeding up the process of Monica dying. Well, Stephanie, I'm glad you're here. I'm Thank sorry you. that you need to be. I am too. Uh, but I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that you're here as well. Thank you. You both love Monica. Yes. And you both want what's best for her. Of course. W would you agree with that? That's why I'm here. You're essential in her life right now. You're, you're her primary caregiver. Yes. And I'm going to tell you that based on everything that I see, uh, there's good and bad to that, but I think if you weren't there, I don't think she would be here. Yeah, I think you're correct. You say you think it's toxic, and tell me why. Stephanie tries to help her as much as she can, but she gives her free access to credit cards where Monica is able to purchase the things that I believe contribute to her making her sicker um, and ruining her health further. Mm -hmm. but she says you haven't been around much lately. You've kind of put up some boundaries. Correct. She was definitely too reliant and wanted me to be there 24-7. Uh, again, at the time, married, had a daughter, um, and I just couldn't be there first thing in the morning, and she wanted me to stay till she fell asleep, so all day, and then wanted me to promise she's, I'm coming back the next day. Uh -huh. All right. And do you feel like she's abandoned her? Not at all. I knew nothing about any of this. Okay. Can we agree that she is deteriorating? Oh, substantially. Okay. Yes. And why do you think that is? Um, I think that is because she has C. diff and she hasn't been able to have it treated. Uh, she probably got it in the hospital when she had her baby almost two years ago. And she hasn't been able to have it treated because of the COVID. Mm -hmm. Because the treatment that has worked for her in the past was um, fecal transplants and they're right. not available. Okay. And what is your understanding of what C. diff is? It's a bacterial infection in the intestines and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the procedure that you're talking about worked for her for a period of time. Yes, because it, it gave her new gut flora, new bacteria in her gut, healthy right. bacteria. And right. she had Lyme disease uh, in, uh, was diagnosed. She had it for years according right. to the test, but she was diagnosed in 2013. Actually, she was really sick in 13. In 2014, she was diagnosed by one of the foremost Lyme disease doctors in the country, and um, everything went downhill from there. Uh -huh. It caused problems with her stomach and everything. And she's having trouble now finding someone that will do that procedure again, correct? Yes, because the FDA has pulled fecal transplants from the market right now because of COVID. Now, she wakes up at night and binge eats, and that's why, and not consciously, right, does it in her sleep. And then that winds up making her quite ill the next day, correct? Correct. And so as a result, you've locked all the cabinets up, and mm -hmm. she said, look, you got to chain me to the bed because I'll wake up at night. And the chain's long enough so she can get up and go to the bathroom or whatever. It's not like you're chaining her to the wall. Correct. This is a voluntary thing on her yes. part. It said, you know, just stop me from walking in my sleep to the kitchen so I don't eat something that's going to make me sick. And people might think, oh, come on, you don't get up and sleep eat. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's called S-RED. Right. And that's not all that common, but it is well documented that it occurs. I've studied your situation in great detail, and I have some things to say that I think can really improve this situation. Do you want to know the things that I see f from this chronic disease management standpoint? Sure. Absolutely. Well, coming up, it took every ounce of strength for Monica to fly to Los Angeles to see me. And she's been in bed since she arrived and now is in a wheelchair backstage. So we're going to meet her next.
feel disgusting. People look at me and think I have an eating disorder. I don't have a f Sorry. I don't have an eating disorder. I can't eat. And later, you brought your chains to LA. Why'd you bring them? I sleep eating, because I'll eat whatever. So I bring it just in case. I believe Monica has a mental block when it comes to food because she thinks all food is poison and calls it toxins in her body. Food is Monica's enemy. It's heartbreaking when she asks, Mom, I'm so hungry. I, I, can I have something to eat? We try to find something safe, but it doesn't work and she gets sick. The longest that I know that she's gone without food uh, is 15 days. She collapsed and ended up in the hospital for five days. Her potassium was below one and she was on IV potassium drips for days trying to get it back to a level where she could be released and not have to worry about her heart. Well, Brienne and Stephanie say that Monica's health continues to decline and anyone that's around her uh, worries that she can die. Stephanie says they've tried everything, uh, even voodoo doctors, but nothing works. Monica says everyone blames her for being sick but she says it's not a choice. I have Lyme disease. It's given me a lot of complications in my life. I could eat about five or six things and that was fine. That sustained my life. I was happy. And then when I got C. diff, all of that went away. I couldn't eat one food, nothing. I'm allergic to everything. My gut hurts like you can't imagine. And then I have to spend the whole day going to the bathroom. I don't eat, I can't eat anything. She's seen it, she's my caretaker. She'll usually warm me up a little bit of broth and put a bunch of salt in it and I'll have a couple sips and I mean a cup. Sometimes when I take certain medicines, they have side effects that make you hungry and then, then that's a downfall. Never in my whole life have I ever taken medicine to go to sleep, to sleep all day. I mean, I have a zero quality of life, but it's the only thing that I know to do to get away from the pain for a couple hours. It's too much on your body. It's too much on your heart and your soul. I've lost the majority of my friendships. I've lost, you know, I'm better than them. I, I, don't, I don't see the outside world. I haven't been outside for a year until I came here. My biggest fear is being like this forever until I die. I want to look like I did when I ran marathons and when I weighed 135 pounds and I looked normal and healthy and had an ass and had boobs and looked like a woman. I feel like a 12 year old boy. <laughs> There's nothing sexy about me. I feel disgusting. People look at me and think I have an eating disorder. I don't have a Sorry. I don't have an eating disorder. I can't eat. Monica, it's good to meet you. Good to meet you. And uh, tell me how you're doing today. Not good. Not good? I'm never really doing good. <laughs> what do you think's going to happen with you? I think I'm going to die. You think you're on the way out? Yeah. Do you have any hope at all of turning this around? Yeah. I wasn't completely healthy before I gave birth. I was 80% better though, which is huge, huge. Yeah. Okay, I was showering, I was going to the gym, I was driving a car, I was getting dressed, I was putting on makeup, I was talking to my friends, I was doing normal things. And then when I gave birth, I got C. diff in the hospital and I have not recovered since and I haven't been able to eat anything since, nothing, not, not a grape, not a piece of fruit, nothing. Everything makes me sick. And what do your doctors tell you about this? Because um, a lot of people have this condition, they have the diagnosis of, of C. diff, and they do much better than you're doing. Yeah. My infectious disease doctor is very, very smart. He's the smartest doctor that I know. And he says that the 
food interacts with the bacteria in your gut. And so it, it thinks that your body's allergic and sensitive to these foods. And what do you think about your attitude, your behavior, the psychological aspects of, of what's going on with you? Well, I'm depressed out of my mind. Yeah, I can imagine. I've lost all hope. Yeah. So you do think you're suffering from depression? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't? I mean, I've been stuck in the house for a year. Yeah. I'm bedridden. Right. All I do is lay in bed and then go to the toilet, and then lay in bed and then go to the toilet. Have you heard the term learned helplessness? No. Well, learned helplessness is a perceptual set where people get to the point where they believe nothing is going to change anything that I do. So they, they get the idea that they're helpless. That's a perceptual set that takes over with many chronic disease patients and causes them to just become passive. And you ask them what's going to happen. They say, I'm going to die. And when you gave me that answer, it sounded like you felt like I'm a passenger here. I don't have a choice. I'm on a downward spiral and there's not a damn thing I can do about it. Yeah, I haven't found a doctor who could give me a fecal transplant. That's all I need. If I got a fecal transplant, I'd be a different person in a day. You had that and you aren't. No, I haven't in two years. That's the problem. Right, well, let's take a break. Stephanie says not only does she take care of her 38-year-old daughter, she also takes care of Monica's two-year-old son. And we'll talk about that after the break. I know Monica's relationship with her son is strained because she's not able to care for him. She loves him very much. It's not her mothering that is bad. I'm not a bad mom. I'm just sick. You have to be pretty strong and powerful to be able to do everything that women do. It's Feel Good Fashion with Mary Alice Stevenson. Clothing and self-care is just as important as food and water. We have to wear clothes. There's so much stock that isn't utilized, put into landfills. All of this excess can be used to address the over 37 million people living in poverty. That's so true. I've got a secret with Robin McGraw, available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. two-year-old and I don't want to lose him <laughs> and I have family that don't understand and they're very judgmental and they don't see the pain that I go through I think I should like give them up or something but there's no way I'm not gonna give birth and get sick and then give up my son no I love him too much Monica says that her son weighed only five pounds at birth, and after she uh, went through labor, she was diagnosed with an intestinal infection called C. diff. And Stephanie says that she had to step in and be the sole caregiver for her grandson because Monica is just too weak uh, to actually be able to get up and do the things that a mother would ordinarily do. I have Monica's two-year-old son that I'm taking care of. He's a lovely child, but he is two years old. He takes a lot of time and effort all day long. I know Monica's relationship with her son is strained because she's not able to care for him. She's not able to change his diaper or to pick him up and put him to bed or pick him up off the floor when she's really sick. She's just weak, very weak. But she's a very good mother. When she's feeling better, she gives him all the time she can. She loves him very much. It's not her mothering that is bad. It's her physicality that prevents her from being the person she wants to be for her son. I worry that he needs a younger person to be raising him because he's getting more and more active and he can outrun me in a whip stitch. And I want her to get well so she can do this. And that's what she wants too. I want to be with my son and I want to be normal. I'm not a bad mom. I'm just sick. I love him to death. I do anything for him. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm fighting. Or else I would have given up ages ago. 
I also worry that if she dies, as he gets older and looks at photos and sees how sickly his mom was, that he's gonna look around and say, why didn't anyone help her? At this point, you're doing pretty much everything for the child. Diapers, feeding. She helps when she can, when she's feeling good. Yeah. She's very close with him. Yeah. yeah. This has got to be wearing you out. I'm a little tired. I'm not a young woman. <laughs> yeah, but you're caregiving yeah. and mothering a two-year-old. Um, this has got to be, this wasn't in your grand plan. It was not in my retirement portfolio, yeah. correct. Okay. Look, here's the deal. Both of you have said that on the course you're on right now, you think that, that this could wind up taking your life, that you could wind up dying here and that you've been close to it before, 15 days without eating. And, you know, this can put you into heart failure, uh, it puts you into kidney failure. You can get to that point. And you, you're using a lot of absolutes saying, I can't eat anything. Um, and- I can if I have a fecal transplant, yeah, but well, I can't find anybody to do it for me. That's okay. all that I need. But the reality is you can't get that right now, right? Right now, yeah. Okay, so if that's the reality, then what do you do next? What do you do if you can't get that? I was hoping you could help me get, me get one. Yeah. Well, here's what I think needs to happen. And that is that you have to do everything that you can do to maximize your situation with the things that you do control. For example, I can tell you as a caregiver that the worst thing you can do for a patient is not require them to do everything that they can do. 100% of what they can do. If you're dealing with someone that has a major spinal injury and they can barely walk, and it takes them 10 minutes to get across from here to the end of this dark brown floor to flip a light switch that you could do in six seconds. You have to allow them to take 10 minutes to get over and flip that light switch. You have to require them to do 100% of what they can do because if they don't take 10 minutes to get over and flip that light switch, they'll never get there in nine, eight, seven, six, five, three, and seven seconds, just like you. If you don't require them to become an active member of the treatment team, then they'll never become an active member of their treatment team. And you're being, in my view, way too passive. And, you know, why would you get out of bed? Why would she do anything if somebody's doing everything for her? You buy her laxative, you buy her cigarettes. She orders them on Instacart and they get delivered. She couldn't buy them without you. Why not? She doesn't have any money. Yes, she does. <sighs> I'm sorry, is that no. upsetting? I think that Monica does have risky behavior. Monica always wants to have massages, so Anyone who would be willing to give her a massage, she would say yes to. Well, Monica went to a hotel with a guy she met on social media. When I found out about it, I went to the hotel myself. I walked in and saw her, and she was in the bathroom, not fully dressed. I told him that we were leaving. When Monica feels that desperate, she wants someone to be there. It doesn't matter if she knows them or found them online. You buy her laxative, you buy her cigarettes, you, you do things for her out of love. I mean, she's your daughter. And I, look, if this was my daughter, it would be very hard for me to not do everything that you're doing. I totally get that. I'm, I'm, it's not that I don't understand it. Uh, what would you suggest? Um... Actually, I don't buy her laxatives. Uh, we have Instacart. She orders them on Instacart and they get delivered with everything, with the food bill. Well, you know? it's, but she couldn't buy them without you. Why not? She doesn't have any money. Yes, she does. From what? 
She's on disability. <sighs> okay, is that not making sense? She has her own money, not a lot. She lives with me, but she does have monthly income. <laughs> I'm sorry, is that no, upsetting? No, 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 it's, it's not upsetting. My, my point is, you, you want her to have to do for herself yes. everything that she can possibly do. Correct. And, and I do. If she's on disability, then that's a very minimal amount of money, and she shouldn't be able to afford cigarettes. Well, Lara, that's a point. That's why I'm saying she, does, she can't afford some of those things, and you're making it possible for her, which she shouldn't be doing. She shouldn't be smoking. Correct. It, with, with, and I, I can tell you, if she came to me wanting a, a fecal transplant, the first thing I would do is assess what all is she doing to maximize her health before I'd consider doing this procedure. That, would dis, that alone would disqualify her. And I tell you, 99 out of 100 doctors that can do that procedure, that would disqualify them. She's never been told that by any doctor never. that she's gone to. Okay. And they are GI, doc GI doctors in Florida and Wisconsin. I, I agree with you. I think the smoking is horrible. But I've never been told that. No. Well, if you can find one that will do it, then great. Yeah. We'll they good. should not. Okay. If she is putting toxins in her body, then they shouldn't perform a procedure to take toxins out of her body. If she's voluntarily putting toxins in her body, it would be really odd. I, I don't know a doctor that would perform a procedure to take toxins out of her body if she is voluntarily putting toxins in her body. Now that, that has to make sense. It does make sense. But the main thing right now is, is COVID. Her doctor in Florida, who's done fecal transplants on her before, and he is, he is an, um, uh, a GI doctor, and she's and been going to him for years. Uh, okay, he, but, he, he can't because of COVID. Okay, but that's not responsive to my point. My point was, is she doing everything she can do to maximize her health profile? Right. Coming up, Stephanie says... She needs to put chains on her refrigerator and cabinets so Monica won't binge eat at night. Did Stephanie and Monica bring her chains to L.A.? We'll talk about that next. If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, come see us in studio. And check out our new photo booth. Come take your photo on the blue carpet. find your photos on my private Facebook group, Dr. Phil Fanatics, by scanning this QR code or search for Dr. Phil Fanatics on Facebook and press join group. Look in here. Right, good picture. We have some exciting things in store you don't want to miss. When I'm caring for Monica, she wants me to hold up foods, whether it be a can of fruit, a box of noodles, anything. She wants me to physically hold up that item to her stomach. And if she hears her stomach gurgling or making some noise, she believes she's allergic to it. She says, I can't have that. But yet if she holds up her cigarettes to her stomach, she believes she's not allergic to it. First off, do I believe that you are legitimately ill and medically ill, or do I think you're, this is all psychosomatic and in your head to get attention or whatever? Let me be very clear in case that's rattled around your head based on what I'm saying. There's no doubt in my mind that you are physically ill, 100%. Is it exacerbated by some psychological elements and some behavioral choices? Absolutely, 100%, no doubt in my mind. 
that you can be healthier than you are if you would change your behavior and and you would help with that and you have stopped almost all healthy behavior and become almost completely behaving like a dying person and if you behave like a dying person, you will become a dying person. You have to behave differently than that. And whether you like hearing that, what you want to hear is, I'm going to send you somewhere for a fecal transplant. I'm not going to make efforts to do that unless and until you are 100% maximizing everything you can do on your end to be healthy and vibrant as you can be within the confines of the disease that you have. I can't eat, so that's not... That's not I mean, true. We, we see what happens when I eat. Well, that's not true. Why? You, you said you just got a nutritionist, so... And everybody can eat something, and you're eating practically nothing, correct? I eat, like, every five days, and then... That's, I have diarrhea 15 times a day. You're not going to convince me that there is not more that can be done in that regard. And to say I eat every five days is, is simply unacceptable. You, you simply cannot accept that. You can't do that. You can't accept that. That's just simply not, that's just not an answer. And so you have to continue until you find something some combination of foods, some type of, whether it's, it's probiotics and foods and combination, whatever is necessary, and you have to be compliant with the gastroenterologist and the nutritionist, and it, I'm not saying that they're gonna give you the answer in the first five minutes, but you've got to be compliant and behave your way to success. When you have chronic disease, you have to be an active manager of that. You have to deal with the psychological aspects, the behavioral aspects, the nutritional aspects. You have to deal with every aspect of it. You, you brought your chains to L.A. Why? I haven't used them. Why'd you bring them? Just in case. Some hotels have food, like, right outside. And me, I don't want to wake up. Like I, have, bar. I have S-Red, which is sleep-related eating. It's like sleep walking or sleep driving, but sleep eating. Yeah, I know what it is. And um, if I do it, I'll just get way sicker because I'll eat whatever. So I bring it just in case the hotel has like stuff outside, but this hotel doesn't, so I didn't, I don't have to use it. Well, so what are Monica and her loved ones going to do? I mean, what are they hearing me say? Um, I got some questions when we come back. <music> Stephanie, what do you what do you hear me saying? That we need to go about this in a different way. That uh, and and I understand the, the psychological con <clears throat> excuse me connection. And some of the things you've said, I've said to her also. Um, but it doesn't seem to solve the problem when she gets this sick. It's uh, very difficult to watch her be in so much pain uh, and screaming sometimes and on the floor. Uh, and I can't do anything about it. And I can't. There, I have very little I can do to help her other than drive her to a doctor, uh, to an appointment if she needs to, or uh, support her in some way and take care of her child. Mm -hmm. That's my role right now. But we're agreed that what y'all are doing now isn't working. It's not working, no. And, and what I'm suggesting is a very different mindset here, because here's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that if you become a patient, if that becomes your identity and you surrender to the disease and become passive as a patient, that at that point, learned helplessness sets in and you're done. 
you're done. And at this point, all she is saying is, I need a fecal transplant and nothing else, nothing else I can do. Nothing else I can do. And that is absolutely not true. You are not requiring enough of yourself. Well, let me conclude by saying this. Um, I, I am not giving you medical advice here. That is not my lane. I'm telling you there is a huge psychological overlay here, huge, that will sabotage the best medical regimen. I agree. If you don't do the things that you need to do. And I'm telling you that you need to deal with the depression. You need to become a very active member of the treatment team. Chronic disease is a very difficult thing to live with and manage and at, for family and for the patient as well. And I'm saying you need to require more of yourself and you need to require more of her. And I'm not saying that in a punitive way. I'm saying when you do, then she has more of the life that she deserves. You're not doing anything to sabotage her. You're not doing anything to hurt her. Everything you're doing is out of love for her. I see that. I can see it in your eyes when you look at her, when you talk about her. But you guys deserve better care, and you need to require more of her, and you need to require more of your treatment team. And before you go in to see your doctor, you need to write down what your questions are, what your needs are, and when you get in there, realize that doctor's working for you. You don't go in there and get hurried. You go, you write your questions down ahead of time and you say, all right, sit down, doc, because I got some stuff to go over here and take the time. It's patient bill of rights. You write down what you want to know and you demand to get the answers and put together that treatment team. And you can turn this around. And when you're active like that, and you get to the point where you now ask for a procedure, you deserve the procedure, you've earned the procedure, you have the right to ask for the procedure and they will take you seriously. Right now, you are a doctor would look at you and say you are a high risk patient that is very likely to not be satisfied and they're not going to rush to treat you. I wanna thank my guest today. For more information about today's episode and questions that you may have, go to drphil.com. You may have stories of your own you want to share, so click be on the show. Uh, you know where to find me on social media. And uh, don't forget to uh, sign up for my Facebook group called Dr. Phil Fanatics. That's P-H-A-N. It's a private group for super fans where you'll get the latest Dr. Phil news first. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks where you will be informed, engaged, and learn new strategies for success in implementing new strategies in your life right now. You don't want to miss that. And you have to check out Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret with Robin McGraw, to feel empowered and informed to live your happiest, healthiest, and most fun life. Check it out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll see you next time. I hope you hear what I'm saying.
On Dr. Phil. Sean is the whole package. I feel he's my soulmate. I gave my mother an ultimatum. To either speak with Dr. Phil or I was done speaking to her. Your son believes to the core of his soul that somebody is breaking your heart and stealing your money. He's never met her. No. Is he educated? Yes, he has his master's. Happiness just enter into my life through my ear. He must have skipped fifth grade because that's where they teach grammar. Everything he's told you is a lie. This is a scumbag piece of trash that is stealing your money and breaking your heart. I don't believe it. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Get ready, take care of you. Well, you know, I read through the emails and letters that I get daily. We categorize them, we put them in groups, and I look at the ones that I think are going to relate most to all of you here and all of you at home. And these are a stack that are thanking us for raising awareness about online love scams. Now my guest today, Darcy and his wife, Lindsay, are also fans of our platform and say they have replicated techniques from past episodes to convince Darcy's mom, Nancy, that she's being scammed by someone calling themselves Sean Carter. Now, Darcy says they were talking to my producers last year and almost had the opportunity to meet me, but his mom declined. Nancy says then her son and daughter-in-law have refused to speak to her and even said, as far as they're concerned, she's dead to them. Now, while Darcy wrote to me concerned about his mother, Nancy's online boyfriend, Nancy says today's not about this boyfriend. It's about fixing the broken relationship with her son. She says Darcy will only speak to her if I'm the mediator and wants to talk to her son one-on-one -on -one for the first time in over a year. Take a look. My mother, Nancy, has fallen for an online love scam. 
I share I wrote to Dr. Phil about my mother's online relationship with Sean Carter. We were actually supposed to meet with Dr. Phil last year, but at the last minute, Nancy decided that she didn't want to do it. I gave my mother an ultimatum. It was either for her to speak with Dr. Phil or I was done speaking to her. She didn't change her mind about it, so Lindsay and I have had to cut her off. We have tried everything to prove this to her. Within three months, you send him $108,485. We have shown Nancy episodes of Dr. Phil, but she still doesn't think that Sean is a scam. My mother gave us the address to which this Sean lives. And I found a real estate agent who lives in that neighborhood. He told me that he had never seen him in that neighborhood. The realtor also told us that that exact address was in fact used for other online scams. I reverse image searched Sean's photo and I found the actual man behind the pictures and he was a French man. And when my mother confronted Sean about this, he explained that he had only used those photos because he looks like the man. And because of his security clearance at his job, he couldn't actually have photos of himself. Even after all of this, my mother continues to talk to him. Nancy doesn't even know what Sean really looks like. My relationship with my mother is pretty much non-existent. She has known me for 32 years and Sean for two. My mother chose Sean over me. I haven't seen Nancy in a year and a half. In my eyes, my mother is dead to me. Well, I hate to hear that. That's not okay. She's not dead to you, and you, you shouldn't be saying that. But I do understand your frustration. When it comes to her soulmate, Sean, Nancy says, it's none of her family's business. Sean's still stuck in Dubai because he does not have the 20 grand to pay the taxes. They've really helped Sean out a lot. I do this because I love him and I care for him. Sean has become the light of my life. Sean is the whole package. I feel he's my soulmate. I have intuition about it. My gut feeling tells me. The last time I spoke to Sean was a couple days ago, and I can't tell you about it because it was kind of dirty. <laughs> he does a lot of sexting to me, and of course I do it right back to him. Sean and I have only been able to communicate over the phone or through text. The reason why is that he's a very private person. These are some of the text messages that I get from Sean. You're a beautiful and sexy girl and you know it. So why are you trying to hide it? Missing you so much, sexy hot girl. My son Darcy and his wife Lindsay are very upset at me with my relationship with Sean. My son thinks that Sean is a scammer, a fraud, and a phony. Darcy's upset because I've sent Sean money and he said to me that he could have used that money to help him and Lindsay have a baby through in vitro. My son Darcy is controlling, rude, and argumentative. My relationship with my son and daughter-in-law is broken. In my eyes, sitting down with Dr. Phil has nothing to do with Sean. What I want to talk to Dr. Phil about is to fix my relationship with my son and with my daughter-in-law, Lindsay. Well, it's good to see you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Well, it's good to meet you. You said that this really isn't about your relationship with this Sean. It's about your relationship with your son. Yes. And... I agree with you to a large extent. I, I don't like this family being fragmented at all. No. And I, I want your relationship with your son to close ranks. I want you two to be back in each other's lives. He's frustrated because he thinks you're being scammed. Yes, he now, is. If he knew something that somebody was hurting you, somebody was exploiting his mother, what would you expect him to do? What would you want him to do? Well, he has helped me try to find, you know, the real person. Um, but that's okay, but that's not my question. Whether it was this or if somebody was poisoning your food or breaking into your house at night and stealing money, if he knew somebody was hurting you in some way, and he knew that in his heart. He believed that to the core of his soul. What would you want him to do? What would you expect him to do? To help me. 
you would you would expect him to passionately advocate for you, right? Yes. That's what he's doing. He believes to the core of his soul that somebody is breaking your heart and stealing your money. Mm -hmm. Now, whether he's right or not, that's what he believes. And that's why he's doing what he's doing. And you're saying that's what you would expect him to do if he really believed that. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So how can you be frustrated with him if he really believes that? Maybe he's wrong. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if he believes that, that's what you would expect him to do. Yes. But he doesn't have to uh, not be in touch with me. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. 100% on your side on that. But you would expect him to continue to beat the drum if that truck's coming up behind you. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, is it possible he's right? There's a poem he wrote to Nancy, happiness, just enter into my life through my ear to my brain and I sticked it to my heart. Is he educated? Yes, he has his masters. But he must have skipped fifth grade because that's where they teach grammar. <laughs> and later, why can't he show you his picture? He just can't have any pictures on his phone. The Canadian government says you can't have a picture to show the woman you love. Yeah. You got the CIA, and we got it, too, in Canada. So you think he may be an agent? Yes. Your son's frustrated because he thinks you're being scammed. Yes. Now, is it possible he's right? I mean, is that possible? Yes. It is possible. And if he's right, would you want to know it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Y you would want to know it. Oh, yeah. Now, let me ask you something. Let's say you and I, th this is just hypothetical here. Let's say you and I got together in a nefarious way. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Nancy and Phil show. And we decided we were going to scam somebody. We were going to try and take their money. Who would we pick? Would we pick somebody that was really at the strongest point in their life? Or would we pick somebody that was maybe vulnerable and had really kind of been beaten up a little bit? Probably vulnerable. Yeah, you'd yeah. pick somebody that had kind of been through a rough patch because right. we know that they would have some needs, right? Yes. Like maybe somebody that had suffered a loss mm -hmm. in their life. Mm -hmm. That's who you would pick, right? That's right, yeah. You, you lost your husband. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for your loss, by the way. Thank you. And how long had you been married? About 35 years. 35 years. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a long time to share your life with someone. And it's a, the silence is deafening when they're gone, right? Yeah, Robin and I have been married 45 years. I, I can't imagine walking in a room and, and her not being there one day all of a sudden. It'd be a huge void. And so you would fall right in that category. Mm-hmm. He started telling you things that were music to your ears, Sean did. Uh, here's a poem he wrote to Nancy. He said, hey, baby, since the first day I spoke to you on the phone, I knew a new tone and voice of happiness just enter into my life through my ear to my brain, and I sticked it to my heart. I love you so much, my snow whitey. I love you so much, my sweetie. I love you so much, my naughty Nancy. I love you so much, mousy mouse. I love you so much, sweet lips. I love you so much, my baseball bat girl. I love you so much, Darcy mama. Mm -hmm. Where's he from? Canada. Canada. And is he educated? 
Yes, he has his master's. Okay. But he must have skipped fifth grade because that's where they teach grammar. <laughs> he went to school in England. Oh, okay. Well, they, they teach it in fifth grade in England, too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so he must have skipped that. Why baseball bat girl? Oh, oh because I had a... He's seen a picture of me wearing a baseball hat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Baseball hat. Yeah. So... <laughs> he meant baseball hat girl? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Okay. I looked into this, Sean, and did a real deep dive on that because I have a lot of resources, as you've seen from some of the things your son right. showed you. Uh, and when we come back, I'm going to tell Nancy what I found out. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to tell her straight up what I found out. And then soon, we're going to talk to her son, Darcy. But first, I'm going to talk to Nancy some more. We'll be right back. I've done a lot of investigations into these love scams, and there's a pattern. So I went through your story, and boy, oh boy. I think I'm having a nightmare. My mom is being scammed by a online con artist. This absolutely makes no sense because my mother was the one who is always up to date about the newest scam. It's crazy, before all of this, we would go to Nancy for financial advice. My mother is the type of person who is scared to shop online as she thinks it's a scam. At this point, I think Dr. Phil will be the only one that can help my mother with her situation. I just hope that Dr. Phil can get through to her before it's too late. Okay, well, Nancy's son, Darcy, says he's gone from having a really close relationship with his mom to practically being strangers all over a man that she's never met or seen. You've actually never seen him on a live feed. No, I haven't. And you've never met him. No. And when you say you've never met him, he just lived two hours away, right? Right. So why never meet him if he's just two hours away? Because when I met him online, um, he had to go to Dubai within like a week. Within a week, he had to leave for work. Yes. Construction. Yes. Work overseas in, mm -hmm. in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And then once, once he got there, um, he got in a bit of a pickle tax-wise, right? And he owes like ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars. It is something like that. Yeah. Yeah, on ten million dollars worth of of income, work, and all. But he, the tax on it's like twenty thousand dollars. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and you've you've tried to help him with that financially. Yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. So he can get back. So you meet him. And as soon as you meet him, he has to leave. And then when he gets over there, he needs money to get back. Mm-hmm. Huh. See, that, that's a red, that was a red flag to me. Because when I, I've done a lot of investigations into these love scams, and there's a pattern that they meet a woman... And because if they're not real, if they're not who they present as a picture, then they have to have some reason to not show up because they're not who they say they are in the picture. If they're a 16-year-old Nigerian girl or a 60-year-old Nigerian man, they can't show up looking like a picture that's not them so they have to say now how can I how can I pull this off and keep the relationship going when I can't show up in the flesh because I'm not that here's the thing I'll go overseas and be working over there and then I can't get back let's take a look at 
this videotape about remote locations, about how these scammers jump into remote locations on a regular basis so they don't have to show up. Take a look at this. I'm in Ghana. He's stuck in Cairo. He ended up in Nigeria. I had rescued Fred from Africa. David went to Indonesia. He moved to Nigeria. He had to go to Nigeria. I mean, time after time, they're all in construction. They're construction engineers. They all had to go to Nigeria, Dubai, Venezuela, all of these other countries, which are far, far away. So they can't come meet you for dinner or Christmas. It's, it's very, very consistent. And I actually put together a, a graphic that shows what some of the consistent patterns are. And I want you to take a look at this and see how much it has in consistent with what you're dealing with. These are typical patterns and excuses of online lump scammers. And I didn't make this up for you. This is just all of them that we dealt with. They say they're arrested, hospitalized, they have sick kids, money or credit cards are stolen, frozen bank accounts. They even had one said they were shipwrecked. <laughs> Honest to God, pirates got them. Uh, they're poetically romantic, my little bat girl. Um, <laughs> they have lost or stolen passports, expired visas or passports. I've actually had them say they were on the way to the airport to come home and they got beaten up. Uh, they're stuck in a foreign country until taxes are paid. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big favorites. Uh, they're widowed, mm -hmm. never a face-to-face -face meeting, poor grammar, fake documents, Photoshop pictures, had to leave immediately after meeting. Like, hi, love you, gotta go. And con they're construction engineers having to work projects overseas. And they need money for lawyer fees, access to insurance payoffs, all of this sort of thing. So I went through your story about Sean Carter and I checked off the things that fit in your story. Yeah. <laughs> and boy, oh boy. <laughs> Widowed, no face to face, poor grammar, had to leave immediately in construction, mm -hmm. stuck in a foreign country until taxes are paid. Uh, just, I mean, all up and down, just consistent, consistent, consistent with everything that's typical. So it made me want to start checking to see whether or not other things checked out. You said he couldn't show you his real pictures because of his security clearance. Right. Even to the woman he loves. And he's a contractor. He must have a little part-time job. I wanted to know whether or not this person even existed because you said he couldn't show you his real pictures because of his security clearance. Right. Because is he like 007 or something? Is, I mean, is he, is he in some kind of undercover work? Or why can't, his, why can't he show you his picture? I don't know. He's under... Uh, I'm sorry? I don't know why. He just can't have any pictures on his phone. Even to the woman he loves? Yeah, I signed a, you know, a very uh, contract, you know, with the government. What government? Canadian. The Canadian government says you can't have a picture to show the woman you love. Yeah. And he's a contractor. Mm hmm. Okay, now, Nancy. This must be his other, he must have a little part-time job or whatever you want to call it. Okay. Now, does that make common sense to you? Well, you got the CIA in the States, right? Right. We got it too in Canada. So you think he may be an agent? Yes. A CIA agent? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I wanted to see if he really existed. Uh, so I, I wanted to check out whether or not someone 
with that name and birth date existed. Mm -hmm. And so with the resources I have, I, if, if he was a secret agent even, he wasn't when he was born. Yeah. He wasn't when he was in the fifth or sixth grade. So those records would still exist. And here are some findings that we've come up with and, and verified. Uh, and, and these are things that our team came up with. You know, we first corresponded with the real man in the photos because there were some photos originally. And we found the man that is in those pictures. We, we, no, I know we talked to the man and he said, these pictures have been stolen. We also found out that a non-resident can open a bank account and have a debit card in Dubai. So he told you that he couldn't. Yeah. And that's why you I needed- I don't think they can. No, they can, I, yes. we. I searched it too. Well, then you talk to the wrong people because they say non-residents can open bank accounts and they can have debit cards in Dubai. Okay. This, is not a, this isn't a close call. This is not a question. You can go over there right now today, open a bank account and have a debit card in Dubai. You can transfer money from here to there. You can do every, there's no, they're, they're very westernized. You can mm -hmm. do everything there that you can do in New York City or Ontario. The phone number that he's given you is listed to a different name. I wonder what the name is. Well, I would happy to tell you that, but not on the air because that would pull somebody else into this that's not involved. Mm -hmm. um, he attended the University of Florida, right? Mm -hmm. No, he did not. He never attended the University of Florida. Nobody of that name ever attended the University of Florida. Nobody of that birth date ever attended the University of Florida. He never attended the University of Florida. That's a lie. It was just made up. We've spoken to the registrar. We've gone all the way back. We went 10 years before, 10 years after. So. What about San Diego? I just found something out. Well, that ain't in Florida. No, I know, but on another, on his LinkedIn. Well, we'll have that checked while I'm speaking. Uh, my control room is on that like a duck on a June bug. <laughs> uh, are you talking about San Diego State or the University of San Diego at California? I am, oh, yeah. I'm... We'll check them both. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if it's got San Diego in it, yeah. we'll check it right now. Um, and there is no Sean Carter with that date of birth in the entire country of Canada. Border to border, coast to coast. This man doesn't exist. This is a scumbag, piece of trash, psychopath, thief in the night that is stealing your money and breaking your heart. He doesn't exist. I don't believe it. He's for real. Not one thing he's told you is true. What's going on? You don't have to believe Darcy, you just have to believe me. This man doesn't exist, not as a secret agent, not as a contractor, not as anyone else. This is very likely some Nigerian sitting in a computer workroom and you're one of 50 or 60 files they're working at one time. Now, I think you know that at some level. You are an intelligent woman. You have questioned this in your heart. I have verified this man doesn't exist. We live in the digital age. Mm -hmm. This man would leave a footprint like a snail walking across the driveway. He does not exist. He is not in Dubai. He didn't go to Florida. We're going to find out he didn't go to San Diego. He does not exist. Everything he's told you is a lie. His phone number, is a fiction, it doesn't belong to him. His pictures don't belong to him. Mm -hmm. He didn't go to school where he said he went to school. He didn't go over there to do this work. He doesn't owe money. He hasn't been there for two years working because that's not possible. We checked to see if he had visas there to work. He does not. I think he's got a business visa. I'm sorry? A business. No, he doesn't. No. He does not. There is no visa there. 
if you have a business visa, you have to work all, you have to list all the principles under the visa. He doesn't exist. He doesn't have a business visa there. You can have a business visa for 30 days, then you can extend it for another 30 days to 60. And at this point, he's been there two years. He doesn't have a business visa there. No, they can have more. You can have five years, I ten year that. visa. And he, and if he did, it would be on record. He doesn't have one. He doesn't have a business visa. He doesn't have an allowance. He doesn't have anything that has extended his right to be there because in order to have something extended, you have to have been there to begin with. You don't just come and go from Dubai. You have to register in. You have to yeah, register I know. out. I know. He did not register in. He has not registered out. And he has not registered there. And trust me, they know who's in that country. He's never been there because he doesn't exist. I don't believe it. Pardon me? I don't believe it. Okay. That's my big question. I want you to tell me what is really going on because you're smart enough to recognize irrefutable, concrete evidence when you see it, and you're choosing not to acknowledge it. So what's really going on? I just believe that he's, he's for real. I mean, some of the things that you have shown me, I, I understand that it could, he could be a scammer. You know, he has all the um, characteristics of some of those things that you wrote. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I believe that he's a real person. <clears throat> okay. Well, there's a real person on the other end. Somebody's yeah. writing to you. Yeah. But it's not who you think it is. I'm serious. Somewhere in Nigeria, in a room... No, no, he's not. There's no, somebody not. sitting and typing, and no. you're one of about 50 people there working. No. No. And there's no one with that date of birth. There's no one in the country where he says he is. There's no one that went to the universities that he says he went to. There's no one with those degrees. There's... There, this person simply doesn't exist. Not one thing he's told you is true. Everything that's verifiable has been refuted. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to know is what's going on with you that knowing that, knowing those facts, knowing he didn't go to the University of Florida, knowing that there's nobody in the entire country of Canada with that name and date of birth, knowing that those pictures are fraudulent and stolen, knowing all of that, you still say, oh, he's real. I'm sending him some more Bitcoin. I'm sending him some more money. Knowing all of that, you continue to insist in the face of evidence to the contrary and no evidence supporting your belief. You continue to embrace this at the cost of your relationship with people that love you, what's going on? Because it's not logical thinking. So uh, my question is, are you delusional? Do you have a mental illness? Are you doing this for some other reason? What is going on? Is there anybody here that believes this is a real man? If you believe this man is a fraud, raise your hand. 100% of the people recognize clearly that this is a fraud. You're not giving him a chance. Is there anybody here that believes this is a real man? Raise your hand if you believe it's a real man. If you believe this man is a fraud, raise your hand. No. 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 Virtual audience, you believe it's fraud, raise your hand. 100% of the people recognize clearly that this is a fraud, except for you. 
and you you don't even blink. It's like, yeah, gotcha. I hear you. See the evidence. You're not giving him a chance to prove himself. Uh, he's had every chance to prove himself. He had a chance to tell you who he was. He had a chance to tell yeah. you the truth. Yeah. He had a chance to give you accurate information. And he gave you lies and asked you for money. Mm -hmm. And if he really loved you, he wouldn't allow you to give him money. He would say, no, keep your money to take care of yourself because I love you and I want you to be secure. I'm a man. I've got a master's degree. I can earn my own money. I won't accept money from you because I love you and I want you to be secure. If he loved you, that would be the rhetoric. Instead, it's send me money to pay these taxes and then I'll come home. And... <laughs> so if you don't look at the logic, look at the emotion of it. it. He's out there working in the world and he's taking money from you. Nobody that really cared about you would do that. No woman would do that with a man. No man would do that with a woman that they really cared about. But you're ignoring evidence and embracing a belief in the absence of evidence. And I'm just saying, explain that to me. I want to know what's really going on. I don't think there's nothing going on. My son thinks I'm delusional. Pardon me? My son thinks I'm delusional. He took me to the doctor. Well... We just spoke to the head of alumni relations at the University of San Diego, and they just confirmed no Sean Carter has ever in the history of the university attended that school. Okay. I mean, however far you want to go, I'll, I'll, I'll go as far as you want to go. I'll track this as far as you want to go, and I'll put my professional reputation at stake. This man does not exist. He is a psychopathic scumbag fraud that's stealing your money and breaking your heart. Okay. And I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear because I care about you as a human being and I don't want to see you taken advantage of. You, you would like me a lot better if I would agree with you. <laughs> And I'd sit over there beside you and we'd take your son on together and put him in his place. <laughs> You'd leave here and say, that Dr. Phil, man, he's, he got your back. He's right there with you. But I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. Now, Darcy says he hasn't seen his mom, Nancy, in person in one and a half years. Well, it's time that they speak face to face when we add Nancy's son next. time today, but we're only getting started. Tune in tomorrow when Nancy and her son Darcy speak face to face for the first time in over a year. And what secret has Darcy been hiding from Nancy about Sean Carter? Well, it shocked both her and me. And will Nancy finally take my advice about Sean? She definitely was not backing down. Next time, a mother and son face off. Hi, Nancy. You call your mother Nancy? Over a catfish controversy. How much have you sent him total? Probably about 50 grand. How much money will you send before you say enough's enough? How long will you wait before he doesn't come back from Dubai? Maybe another year. He might be coming back. I still have to keep an open mind. You cannot put your life on hold for a ghost. That's next time. You do not want to miss that. Look, I want to thank all of my guests today. For more information about today's episode, log on to drphil.com. And if you want to be in the studio audience, yes, we do have live audiences back in the studio now. Just go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. We're following all the CDC guidelines. Everybody here has a mask on, and we're keeping you guys safe, right? They're bringing you in properly. Uh, so we do have audiences back in studio, which really helps me a lot. So if you're in the area and you can be here, we'd love to have you in the studio audience. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. 
Uh, be sure and join the Facebook group, Fanatics, that's P-H-A-N. It's a private group of super fans. And be sure and uh, check out my podcast, Fill in the Blanks. I'm on part four of Toxic Personalities in the Real World. In this episode, I dive into communal narcissists as well as finishing up on malignant narcissist. Also check out Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret, with international best-selling author, journalist, and podcast host Mitch Album. You're going to dive into his highly successful book, Tuesdays with Maury, and his profound new novel of hope and faith, The Stranger in the Lifeboat. You don't want to miss this conversation. Check it out on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Thanks for being here. So long.
today on Dr. Phil. Her husband's an addict. He left our baby in an overheated garage, 100 degrees, screaming, crying. And when my sister was two, fell flat on the concrete. You left this person in charge of your children. It's not happening every single day. You know, serial killers don't kill somebody every day. But mom claims it's her daughter who needs help. I don't think Brindley is the problem. She's getting into fights, sneaking out at night. She's doing a lot of the mothering. She is not. I am doing everything. I always have a baby in my arm. I'm always feeding a kid. She does help me when I ask for you help. You just said I don't help, which is it? Knock, knock. Hi. Hi, Brindley, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Well, I'm okay. I wanted to talk to you before I ever talked to your mom and to Jonah. I need your help to help you because you need some help. You deserve some help. You're getting jerked around. Look, they've dragged you in here for me to rake you over the coals and read you the riot act about your misbehavior tell you what a bad kid you are, straighten your ass up, and then send you guys home. That is not how I see this at all. Okay. They're talking about you running away, all of that. I, I, I was reading through this. I don't ask myself why you're running away. I'm asking myself why you come back. I'm, I'm going to just be straight with you and hope that you'll be honest with me. They say that uh, you're kind of blowing off school, that you're running away, you go out and be gone for two or three days, you're vaping, smoking dope, some of that stuff. That is not good. Mm -hmm. You need to stop that behavior. You're smarter than that. Mm -hmm. You got every excuse in the world. You, you really do. Your mother she's acting like your friend, not your mother. And if she's your friend, she's not a very good one. You got a drunk living in your house. Your mother chooses his drunk over you and, and, and the other children. You're, you're the mother. You're raising these other children. That is not fair. I know you're happy mm -hmm. to do it because you love them. Mm -hmm. And you're doing a good job, by the way. Thanks. And I'm here to fight for you, not with you. I don't know what you expected. I think they, you thought they were going to bring you in and see the principal, and I was going to tell you straighten up. And I do want you to straighten up. I want you to stop doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to help you. You're better than that. You're smarter than that. How frustrated are you? Really frustrated. What is I'm she stressed. What does she say to you about bringing Jonah back in the house all the time? I ask her not to. She... She tells me she likes to sober him. She, she says that she married to sober him, but when is he ever sober anymore? But he comes back four hours later, drunk again. I, I beg her to like at least two weeks, three weeks, let him, or a month, let him straighten up. But she lets, as soon as he sends her a text saying, oh, I'm clean or anything like that, right back in the house. A week I later. I've got him on tape saying he's not going to get sober because he or clean from drugs because he doesn't want to get sick. He's saying straight up, I don't, I'm not going to do that. I don't know what he's telling her, but he's telling us he isn't going to do it because he doesn't want to go through the withdrawal. He doesn't want to get sick. She's paid for him to go to rehab twice. Money she should be putting in a college fund for you, for the, for the, you, the other Everything goes kids. to him. Everything goes to him. You deserve better. What do you say to yourself about that? It's just hard. It's really hard. I try to be there for my sister because she doesn't need to see that. She doesn't need to see them screaming. I take care of her. I make sure she doesn't see that. I've been seeing it since I was six years old. <sighs> He's pushed my brother away. He was the only one. He used to take care of us. He used to, he used to be the one keeping me away from it, trying to keep me away from it. But 
he's gone. He's gone by now. I would have been gone by now if I had the chance. Absolutely. <laughs> so he's made me lose my brother. Um, a bunch of my friends are scared to come over. Um, how many times like, my neighbors have seen cops at my house? It's um, it's embarrassing, and it's hard. I've been making police statements since I was seven. Yeah. That's not right. You know, she's she says she doesn't want to be a single parent raising three children. Hell, she's raising four children. <laughs> He just adds, he's another he's, child now. Exactly. I take responsibility for what I do. When I smoke weed, I, that's, that's on me. I do that. But him, anything that goes wrong with him, oh, well, Brinley did this. Well, Brinley did that. Well, Brinley didn't do this. You're a grown-ass man. Take responsibility for what you do. Well, he's asked you for weed, right? Oh, yeah. He'll offer it to me, ask me where I get it, ask me um, where he can get some. It's criminal. I don't mean that figuratively. I mean, that's criminal. That's contributing to the delinquency of a minor. It's endangerment of a child. And he's doing it in the home with other children. That's criminal behavior. And if your mother allows that to go on, that's criminal behavior. This has to stop. And I intend for it to stop. And I intend for you to be out of the pressure cooker. Anytime Jonah steps out, I step in. Yeah. I mean... I've been raising them. I've been raising my twin sisters. I always have a baby on my arm. Always I'm feeding a baby. Always I'm changing a diaper. Yeah. And they're nine months old? Twins. Yeah. Nine Twins. months old. Nine months old, yeah. And where's your mother when this is going on? She has work. She's either feeding one of the babies and I have one or in switch off. And what does she do when Jonas passed out on the couch? This is him around the house. He's fallen with the babies in his arms. Oh. Yeah, we take camping trips to Lava. My mom took my little sister to go, you know, to go to take her to the pool. And she left me alone with him and the twins. Falling asleep by the baby, screaming, crying in his arms, and he's passing out. I said, just give her to me. I took care of both babies, got one baby down that night, and I was taking care of the other, changing her, doing everything while my mom was gone. Did he forget one of the children in the garage? Yep, forgot one of the children in the garage while he was high and drunk. 100 degrees. 100 degrees, screaming, crying. Oh, and when my sister was two, fell flat on her, on the concrete. Well, here's what your mom has to say about you, just so you know, which I'm not, I, I didn't buy for a minute, which is why I'm here talking to you first. My 15-year-old daughter, Brinley, has been a total teenage nightmare. You you look stupid and you're a terrible mom. She's getting into fights, vaping, smoking marijuana, sneaking out at night. It's actually killing me and you're adding more stress to my life. I can't wait for freedom, so that's why I just immediately act. When I try to punish her, she just runs away. It's like she's punishing me for punishing her. She figured out she could fit through this tiny laundry room window over here. We put a piece of plywood so she could stop going out. We had to put a board in, silicone is up here, and then here's the lock up here to stop it from opening this way. When you get back from running away, I just scream like a psychopath and then it's over. What's your punishment? Last year, she was at a boy's house and I called the police and told them where she was at. When the police arrived, she took off running from them and they had to put her in handcuffs. She's been to the juvenile detention centers about four or five times. She told me that she loves going there because the guards are so nice to her, and she says they even call her daughter. I need to get my parenting skills in check or Brinley is going to continue heading down this road to nowhere. Well, it's probably a break to go to juvie. I mean, at least you're not having to put up with all that. What do you think about what she's saying? I think she's very fake. <laughs> She says that this was all about Jonah. She said she said not one word about me except that I smoke pot and that um, I'm a, I run away. That's mm -hmm. all she said that she said. Um, she's crazy. You got reinforcements now, okay? Thank so you. we're gonna deal with this together. But you understand, I wanna be very clear 
I don't endorse this behavior you're doing. You got to get that under control. And I want you to get your grades up because you deserve better. Okay. You know that I don't think you should be smoking dope and vaping and running away. I don't want you getting hurt out there. Okay. Look, I I'm going to go talk to your mom now and I'm going to be very, very straight with her. She's never had that. She's never, nobody can tell her wrong. She thinks she's in the right 100% of the time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. Okay. I'm going to be talking to mom when we come back. I don't get it. I don't get what the hell you're thinking. I don't get what the hell you're doing. I don't get how you're making that okay. Do you consider him to be a danger? And later... It's like having a, a fifth child at home that I'm looking after. No, you're not. She's doing a lot of the mothering. She's changing diapers and feeding babies just like you are. <laughs> she is not. She is not there doing anything. Say hey to this courageous young woman, Brindley. <laughs> Brindley and I just had a conversation backstage, which is kind of way out of order. It's not what we normally do, but I wanted to sit down and talk to her because I thought her mother and Jonah were seriously dragging her to the altar here thinking, I was going to straighten her up and then everything was going to be okay. I just don't believe that. I don't think that's what's going on. And so I was just straight with Brindley and we had very clear understanding, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, now I do want to talk to mom. So can we bring Cassie out and let's uh, continue on. Say hi to Cassie. Let's <laughs> put you right here. Cassie, I know you were upstairs and coming down and haven't listened, but I've just had a conversation with Brinley, and um, she and I were very straight with each other. And uh, I think that right now, you're in a situation with a very dysfunctional family. Agree? I agree, absolutely. And there are problems. I think she is a symptom of the problem. I don't think Brindley is the problem. I think she's showing some signs of stress and the problem, but I, I told her, I, I don't wonder why she runs away. I wonder why she comes back. I, I, I seriously, I don't get it. I don't get what the hell you're thinking. I don't get what the hell you're doing. I don't get what the hell you're doing with this Jonah coming into the house time and time and time again. In fact, based on what you've told me about Jonah, having him in that home around those children is criminally negligent. I don't get how you're making that okay. Here's what I think is the real problem. Let's take a look at this and I'll let you respond. I cannot live my life like this, Jonah. You need to make a decision. If you're going to be high, or if you're going to stay sober and be here for your family. My husband, Jonah, is a complete addict. He's addicted to Xanax, Klonopin. Within the last two years, I've sent Jonah to two different rehabs. He's relapsed after both. I have found alcohol bottles inside the couch. He's even hid alcohol in our vacuum cleaner. Our ceiling isn't finished above the water heater and stuff. So up in here, there's like spaces above the vents where he would hide the bottles up there too. A few years ago, Jonah was drunk, picked up our three-year-old and was walking with her. You tripped and fell with her and, and her face hit the concrete and bruised her entire cheek. I'm very ashamed. I am so stressed. I'm losing weight like crazy and I'm losing my hair. You don't have to be afraid. Of, I am afraid. I, I know I don't have to be, but there's nothing that can stop me from being afraid. I haven't been able to call it quits with Jonah yet because I remember the days when he was sober and how much I loved him. Okay, so you get that he's seriously impaired. 
I do, to a point. I see so many instances where he he doesn't he's not drunk or he's or he's not so far gone like that. And every day I just keep hoping that more and more of those days are gonna come because he wasn't always like that. <laughs> You, you know, Brindley describes you as being in denial about this. She didn't use that word. She just said you just keep believing him when he says he's going to get sober, right? Yeah. And do you consider him to be a danger? It's not happening constantly. He's so charming and he's so believable. I want it to be true. He's standing there stone holding a baby, but he has some good days in between. And later, other than the drugs and alcohol, he's a, he's a decent guy, right? Yeah, he's wonderful. Well, let's check his criminal history. Oh, oh my God. When our patients come in and want to quit smoking, what I tell them to do is... The secret to kicking the habit. If people see how unrewarding a behavior is now, that's how we change any habit. With addiction psychiatrist, Dr. Judd Brewer. So what can relapsing do to your progress? Two step forward, one step sideways. There's no step backward. I've got a secret with Robin McGraw. Thank you for explaining that to me. How much do I owe you? <laughs> Available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. consider him to be a danger? He can be. I believe that he can be a danger to our kids. Um, and, but it, it's not happening constantly. And so that's why I, I do believe him that he's going to get sober, he's going to get better because when he says it when he's sober, he's so charming and he, he's so believable. And I, my kids love him so much, like my six year old loves him so much that I, I want it to be true. He's not a danger every day. You know, serial killers don't kill somebody every day. <laughs> bank robbers don't rob every bank they drive by. <laughs> you know, he left a child in the garage. It was 100 degrees outside in the garage. That's enough to, to dehydrate and kill an infant in a matter of hours. But he had some good days in between. <laughs> okay, he fell with this baby and smashed her face in the concrete. He left the other one in a stroller in the garage for hours when it was 100 degrees outside. He's standing there stoned in that picture holding a baby, but he has some good days in between. <laughs> That's what keeps me going. That's what makes me want to believe that it can all go away because it's not happening every single day that I believe that he can be a good man again and get the help that he needs and get sober. I'm sure he can be a good man again today. I am the incurable optimist and I believe in the human spirit and I believe that that man like every other can turn things around, but not on your watch, mom. You have undivided loyalty undivided responsibility to your children. He has given her weed. He has come to her to get weed. He gives me excuses and or but when he explains it to me, he says, you know, she was begging, she was really tired, she couldn't sleep and so I gave it to her. She goes, was tired, so he asked her for weed? She asked him. Oh, it's been the other yeah. way, too. And he said that he had asked her because he Speak was trying up. to trick her. It was 12, 12 o'clock at night, probably. I was up, sitting on the couch. And he goes, did you smoke weed today? And I was like, no, or else I obviously would be sleeping. And he was like, well, do you want some? And then weeks before, and then or months took it, before. Right? the edible from him? Well, obviously I <laughs> smoke weed. I'm gonna take it. Okay. And so he gave it to her? Yeah. And months and or weeks before he's asked where I've gotten it from, where he can get some. Okay, let, let's freeze frame this for a minute. You, you just said that he, he's asked her for some and he offered her some 
and she took it. So he gave illegal drugs to your 15-year-old child in your home. Doesn't sound like much when you say it real fast. Let's slow down. He gave illegal drugs to your 15-year-old child in your home and then came and got in your bed. I was not home that weekend. I was away with my twins. You were home. I, you were home when he weekend, gave me weed. I was not home. Okay, was hold on, hold on. Freeze frame, freeze frame. So you left this person in charge of your children? Yes, I did. Oh, oh. The two older ones, oh, not the babies. Oh, Cassie, when you are in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> Cassie says three weeks ago she kicked her husband Jonah out because his addictions have made him a danger to her children. Well, sometimes he's a danger to her children, but he has good days. We'll meet him after the break. Cassie kicked me out, so I'm living with my mom. I think that you choose your addiction over your family every day. I'm afraid to stop because I'm afraid to get sick or withdrawal. And you're more afraid to get sick than to lose us and lose your kids. Yeah, kids. yeah. Like I said, my addictions made me very selfish. A month ago, Jonah was sitting in the kitchen with one of our twins. When I asked him where the other baby was, he got up frantically looking for her around the house and couldn't find her. I went out into the garage and she was sitting in her footy, sweaty pajamas in our stroller and it was 100 degrees that day. Jonah said that he had taken marijuana edibles, but I think that he was on something a lot stronger that made him forget that he left our baby in an overheated garage that could have killed her. Now, Brindley says she absolutely hates her stepfather, Jonah, and claims he's earned that because he refuses to get sober for their family. Now, just before the break, we confirmed that he gave illegal drugs to your underage daughter, and, and then you said you, you weren't there, you left him. You've described him as a glorified babysitter, your words. A well, he, as my yeah, a roommate who co-parents with me. Okay, so you you've also described him as a hopeless relapsing alcoholic addict. And he's your designated babysitter. My well, my mother lives down the street as well and was supposed to be coming in checking in on them every single day. I took the I was only gone for 3 days. I had my twins with me. And her, she was there going to be helping too. But my mother was down the street and that was the plan. I originally did not want to leave them with him, but... But she, you did. But I did. Okay, so he's your designated babysitter. By the way, who did you turn down as babysitter? My mother. Is she a serial killer or something? <laughs> no. no really, who did you turn down to say, okay... Let me see, who can I have watch the kids? Um, let's see, he's left one in the garage at 100 degrees. He dropped one on the pavement and fell on her. He's an addict and an alcoholic, hides booze all over the house and says, oh, he's not interested in stopping because he'll make him feel bad. Um, yeah, he's good. <laughs> that, that's the resume. Alcoholic, drug addict, doesn't want to quit, has put two children in physical danger, that's my guy. I'll put him in charge. Seriously? What, what, what do you, what, what? She didn't want to go to my mom's. She told me that she was going to help and be there and let me know if anything went wrong. Leaving and them so alone I, with him? I trusted her and I wanted her to be happy. I, I wanted her to she wanted, I gave her the choice to stay home and help me with, be with Jonah or to go have to stay at my mom's the entire weekend. And but, I'm not chose. leaving. But other than drugs and alcohol, he's a, he's a decent guy, right? That when he's not drinking yeah. or anything? Yeah, he's wonderful. Well, let's check his criminal history. 
Oh, oh my God. May 6, 21, use of a firearm by restricted person, third degree felony pending trial. 12821, retail theft, shoplifting, misdemeanor, class C. 81120, possession of a controlled substance, misdemeanor, class A. 122419, retail theft, shoplifting, misdemeanor. 102615, disorderly conduct, other misdemeanor. It goes back, we've got over 20 charges against him, most of which were convictions. Most of them are misdemeanors, two are felonies. There's a third one pending, and then a fourth one. If I do my job as a mandated reporter for endangerment of children. So he has two felony convictions, one pending, and one hanging in the air if I pick up the phone. This is the nice guy other than And they're but they're all related to to alcohol and drugs. Oh well, okay, this, okay, never mind. Well what I mean is is like it's that he has struggled with addiction for most of his adult life. And these, every single thing that he has been in trouble for has, he has been intoxicated or been on something yeah. that. Like it, the times he hurt your children? Yes. And the times that he hurt my children. He's told you straight up, he ain't quit. I think that I'm in denial. Have you been drinking today? Well, let's meet Jonah. Right now, I have no relationship with Brindley. I'll say that I'm gonna stop drinking and doing drugs, and then I'll, I don't. Brindley is sick of hearing all the broken promises. She sees you drinking, and she knows about your addictions, and it is making her hate you. Brindley is completely out of control. I think Brindley does blame me for ruining our family and all of her behavioral issues. I think it's just an excuse. If he could beat the addiction as easy as we're telling him to beat it, that he would. You're a grown ass man. Take responsibility. I think Cassie's parenting plays a huge part in Brindley's behavior. Cassie is a very reactive person. If she's done something like her behavior is out of control, I'm just constantly screaming or she's screaming back. Obviously I know the crap I do. I, I need to be punished for it. Right now I'm not living with a family. Cassie kicked me out, so I'm living with my mom. Cassie's taking care of the kids and the household all by herself. I think that you choose your addiction over your family every day. I'm afraid to stop because I'm afraid to get sick or withdrawal. And you're more afraid to get sick than to lose us and lose your yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, my addictions made me very selfish. For the longest I've been sober it was probably about a year and a half, and that was like 10 years ago. I don't want my girls growing up to marry a man like you. I don't want them to go through what I'm going through. If you can't get clean, the only other thing that I can do is get divorced. Yeah, I want to get better for my family. Why can you just stayed sober today after you woke up three hours ago because of my anxiety yeah i'm desperate to do anything to get sober jonah thank you for being here yeah thank you have you been drinking today no sir drugs today uh my prescription yeah your prescription just is sub Xanax? subutex just subutex, subutex. Uh, -huh. uh why not drink today um i don't know because i'm taking this seriously and drink I yesterday i not yesterday the day before i did have a beer yeah. uh -huh. okay uh, i give it to you for being honest because you said on the tape I, I don't intend to quit because i'm selfish and it would make me sick with withdrawal which is would be really rugged as much as you drink and she said so you're choosing your alcohol and addiction over your family and you said yeah because this addiction has made me very selfish. So yes, I do choose my alcohol and addiction over you and the family. Yeah, I so do. So he's told you straight up, he ain't quitting. There was a choice to be made, he made it, you lost. <laughs> do you have trouble hearing that? I mean, registering that in your brain? I mean, I know you hear it, hear it, but I mean. I. I think that Brinley's right. I think that I'm in denial. I think that I want him to be clean and sober so bad for 
for me and for my kids that I, I think that he's wrong and I think that it can happen. I think that he can get sober. And I, I just keep, I keep hoping every day. I don't want to get divorced and then him get sober and a year later and then what? I, he's been sober for a year and I'm, I'm here stuck taking care of everything still. I don't know why I can't distinguish the difference. I'm just taking care of everything now by myself without his help. I, it's like having a, a fifth child at home that I'm looking after, making sure he's not falling downstairs or something. And that, you know, I feel like I'm doing that already, so. No, you're not. She's doing a lot of the mothering. To the two of you, to, to the, the other children, she's, she's changing diapers and feeding babies just like you are. <laughs> she is not. I, she's never home. She's never home. Her friends and Snapchat and, and Instagram is the most important thing to her. She is not there doing anything. I have to beg her or bribe her that she can hang out with friends while she's there to, to help me. I have to ask her numerous times to do something. I can't get her to clean her room. I can't get her to do anything. When she is watching a baby, she puts, it in, puts one of them in a bouncer and she's back on a tablet or a phone. I never ask, I hardly said, ever ask for you help. You just said I don't help, which is it, okay. which is it? You're missing the point, you're twisting my words. I can't get her to get out of her room to help me. Trust me, I, when there are times where well, I, I have to do something, she I can't imagine why she wouldn't want to come out of her room. Well, I mean, I, I've I kicked Jonah that. out. I mean, what more does she want? I always have a baby in my arm. I'm always feeding a kid. When is she ever over? My grandma, she says my grandma helps. I hear her complaining about me 10 times a day that she don't do shit for her. And that is true. And that so, is true. So, and you're going to say that Grammy helps more I'm than saying, me? No, Grammy doesn't help more than you. But she is there helping. But that you, she can't back up your story because I she's never there I help more than either. him. I even help more than him. You do. You do. But... As of late. As of lately. As of lately, yes. Okay, so let me get your story straight. You said she doesn't do anything except she helps more than grandmother and she helps more than Jonah and she does have been helping well, of late and so which goes she does absolutely no nothing me. except right. she helps more than everybody else. And every, But this is like 10%. I am doing everything. Everything is on me. But when I say she helps more than them, that shows you how little they do for me because she's not doing very much. And, and the reason why I can tell you that is because when we were in family therapy, she expressed that my grandmother or my mother tries to put pressure on her that because he's gone, she needs to step up and help me. That is not right. She is my 15 year old daughter and it's not her fault that we had twins. It's not her fault that another baby came into this family. And I don't want to put that on her. And so I don't. And I do not. And she says, Mom, I, you know, she'll ask me sometimes, do you need anything from me before I go hang out with my friends? And I'll ask her and she'll do it. And then she'll take off, you know, and, you know, little things here and there. Hold one baby for me while I bathe the other baby. But, um, but I try not to, I'm not putting it on her because she says it's very stressful for her, which it should be. And I shouldn't be asking her to step up because my husband's gone. It's not her job to take care of the children. And, but, so I'm not putting her down for not helping me more at all. She's my child too. They're not her children. But she does, in order to leave, like she will ask me, what do I need? She does help me when, when I ask. A lot of the time she does. Which but I it? never, I hardly says. ever ask for you help. You just said I don't help. Which is it? Okay. Which is it? You're missing the point. You're twisting my words. Well, may I say something here? Yes. You do deserve a husband that helps you. And you don't have one. <laughs> because he told you he made a choice and you lost. And she is there. And she does help. I don't know how many percent you want to assign it. I, I, it, it probably would be more if you didn't call her bitch and little when you're mad. She says she hates me, wishes she would have gotten an abortion with me, pulls me by my hair. <laughs> All of which you admit. Oh, I pulled her by her hair, but I didn't tell her I wish I would have had an abortion. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Well, Sandy says, 
Uh, Sandy says her daughter Cassie is an awful parent, a total narcissist, and takes zero blame for anything. Well, so who is Sandy? Well, it's her mother. We'll add her to this conversation after the break because I'm going to get to a conclusion here. It's going to have a verb in my recommendation because I have a duty here. We'll be right back. Brinley is supposed to be on Zoloft for depression, but Cassie allows her not to take it. I don't feel like my granddaughter's behavior is gonna get any better until her parents get their act together. We're out of time for today, but there was so much more to cover. So here's a sneak peek at what's happening next time. Next time. Jonah is a total alcoholic. I honestly hate him. A mother must choose her husband. My therapist was telling me, your marriage is supposed to come first. Before your children? Yeah. Or her kids. You're taking care of four kids plus him. I need to ask him to leave, but I can't. There is no lifeguard on duty at this dysfunctional hellhole of a home. That's next time. You do not want to miss that. Cassie says she will do whatever it takes to fix her broken family. But is she willing to choose her children's safety over her drug-addicted, alcoholic husband? Plus, we'll meet Cassie's mother, Sandy. Now, she wrote to me 68 times looking for help with her granddaughter, Brindley's out-of-control behavior. But this is one smart granny, as she says Brindley's behavior will never change until her parents do. She, like me, says Cassie must prioritize Brindley and her other children over her husband Jonah and stop choosing a man who refuses to get sober. Now, I've just begun to dig into what I believe are some seriously questionable and dangerous life choices these parents are making and the damage they refuse to see they are doing to all these children. All of that and more is going to be dealt with next time. Now, I want to thank my guests today. For more information about today's episode, or if you'd like to be on the show, log on to drphil.com and check out my Facebook group called Dr. Phil Fanatics. That's P-H-A-N. It's a private group for super fans where you get all the latest Dr. Phil news first, and I even pop in there from time to time to say hello and join the discussion. Now, I've launched a brand new season of my podcast, Fill in the Blanks. I'm on part four of Toxic Personalities in the Real World. In this episode, I dive into communal narcissists as well as finishing up on malignant narcissists. Listen to Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret, with Emmy Award-winning TV host, chef, and author Daphne Oz. Hear more about Daphne's secret to success and how to create a balanced and healthy lifestyle. Thank you. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.